Hello, and thanks for watching my talk. And thanks also to the Natural History Society of Northumbria for inviting me to give it. I'm going to talk about wildlife tracking devices, wildlife tracking wizardry. These are electronic tags used to study movements and behavior of animals. I'm going to talk about examples of the discoveries made using this equipment. And it's, uh, my talk is going to be a bit of a mixture of technology and biology. Uh, I see these as disparate fields, but as two sides of the same coin. I hope it won't be too technical, but I think it's interesting to see just how the technology helps us to find out about animals. Uh, all sorts of animals are tracked, of course, uh, but I'm going to talk mostly about bird tracking. Uh, and I have to confess a bit of a bias towards night jars, because that's my main study species. Uh, so I'm Brian Creswell. I'm Managing Director of Lotec UK, which is a wildlife tracking equipment designer and manufacturer. Um, I'm a biologist by training and uh, I first got into this game in the uh, early to mid 80s and this is kind of where it all started. There's a picture of me here posing on the back of, a, of a, an old mini traveller which uh, those of you of a certain age will probably recognise. This belonged to a, a friend of mine called Ian Alexander and Ian and I used to go tracking night jars together. So we used to tear around the forest in this vehicle and because it was Ian's car he got to drive and I got to stand on the back just like that hanging onto that roof bar that was never really securely attached. Anyway, it, it survived, as did I, uh, as we tore around chasing night jars. It was great fun. Uh, it didn't look quite like this. It was more like this. Uh, and I'm still tracking now. Nowadays, we have a, a slightly more appropriate field work vehicle, a four-wheel drive Land Rover. I say appropriate, actually. It dis does have some um, slight uh, problems with it. Um, this is a really useful mast we have on the top here. It's retractable, goes to about four meters, but even when it's retracted, it's slightly higher than 2.1 meters, unfortunately, which I didn't realize until I heard the bang. And then uh, you, you can see this, uh, this barrier has been broken before, it's been repaired, this orange bit here. Uh, and they put this big steel sort of cable across it to hold it all together. So once I'd broken it, I trapped myself inside the car park. Uh, I'd also trapped everybody else inside the car park. So I wasn't very popular. Anyway, that's enough of me and my um, fieldwork vehicles. I want to start by talking about some of the difficulties of making tags for animals, challenges of wildlife tag design. Uh, the first complication is that nature is almost infinitely variable. Uh, just thinking about birds, you have this huge variety of sizes from hummingbirds to ostriches. Uh, and this, of course, determines what size of tag you can use. You can't just use one tag on all. Uh, and you also have to make sure that tag can survive the uh, attacks of the of the bird. Uh, I'm not sure we've ever tagged an ostrich. I'm not sure we'd ever dare to tag an ostrich, but I suppose it's possible. And then there's a spatial scale. Some people uh, are wanting to track birds on a global scale, and some people just track them in, in sort of local local areas. Uh, I should say, of course, this, these devices are all used by scientists to, to study birds. So uh, getting back to the spatial scale thing, I put these two pictures in because this represents probably the most extreme migration and tracking example of any bird, which is an Arctic tern migration from pole to pole. I'll talk, I'll talk more about that later. And this here is uh, just to remind me of um, a namesake of mine called Will Creswell, who was tracking migratory pathways in West Africa. Uh, and he had one bird, I think it was a windchat, that spent all its time in one bush. He's very disappointed in this because he thought he'd be tracking them all over the place and find out what habitat they were using. And lo and behold, that was it, the one bush. 
Uh, this isn't the actual bush, this is just a generic bush. So that's all my woes about, um, <laughs> about designing tags for all these different applications. And I'm just going to go through some methods by which tags are attached to different species. Um, here's an on reappearance by some mammals. Uh, these are two sorts of tags on this particular slide. There's a glue mount, which is quite an unusual method for fixing tags to, to mammals actually, but for hedgehogs it's quite good. You can just clip some spines and then glue the tag in with a bit of um, epoxy usually, epoxy resin. Uh, and these tags will fall off when the, when the spines molt because hedgehogs molt their spines just like mammals molt their hair. So that's quite nice, it means the tag isn't on the hedgehog for life, although it does limit the time you can track them. And then a more conventional way of putting tags on mammals is with a collar. Uh, and this rabbit is wearing a, a collar, you can just about see that that's a battery there. And of course, uh, larger mammals that carry larger collars. Getting back to birds, the tail mounts are probably the safest method of tagging birds. And this is a rather ancient picture of a bearded tit with a tag on the tail, you can just about see it there. Now these are the, the tags, well, similar to the tags. They, um, they're fixed, oh, and this is a nightjar. <laughs> this is the first appearance of the nightjar, not the last. Um, and the way we stick these on is we have a groove in the base of the tag, a little groove there, and you put super glue in the groove and then put it onto one of the central tail feather shafts and bingo, it's stuck. You can also tie it on if you're not too sure about super glue, but super glue does stick extremely well to feathers. They're lost when the bird molts as well, so the bird doesn't have to carry them for life. But it doesn't also mean that you can't use a tag on a tail mount if you want to track it for the, the whole uh, the whole year, especially if you need to tag back to recover the data, which I'll talk more about later on. Backpacks are another popular way of tagging birds. What we have here are a few pictures of different sorts of tags. Most of these are attached with harnesses. So this capacadia has got a, a harness. This is a tag here with the antenna. It's got a harness around the body, as has this American woodcock. Um, these are both um, GPS tags. Again, I'll talk about more of those later on. This is actually a satellite phone tag. That's, uh, that's how it works. It communicates with satellites. Uh, this is, a, I think, a masked lapwing. And this tag is also a backpack in that it goes on the back, but it's glued onto the down. And those, those tags will fall off when the bird molts. A harness on a bird won't come off unless you've got a weak link built into it. Uh, you can sew it together with cotton or, or some material that will rot and then eventually that breaks and the harness falls off but that can take quite a long time and you don't want to be putting weak links into harnesses which will break too soon otherwise you don't get as much data as you expected if the tag is still running. Um, and then we have leg mounts this is another quite popular way of fixing tags to birds uh, especially geolocators which I'll talk about later and, and radio tags these are all radio tags this is a rather cute little bitten with a tag on its, on its leg. Uh, most of the tags have got leather straps on them. So the leather strap is put around the leg, a bit like a Jesse on um, Falconer's bird. And then that's, that's it's usually riveted through, through the leather uh, and that will eventually rot and, and fall off. Uh, so again, these are quite short lived tags. I should say something about the potential adverse effects of tagging. Obviously no self-respecting biologist, not even an alien one, would want to harm the animal by having tagged it. So animal welfare is always top of the list. However, there's a less sentimental reason for not harming your animal, and that is the validity of your research. Uh, if you're affecting the animal's behavior by the way you study it, then your data are not valid. Uh, and that's obviously extremely important to biologists, uh, as is animal welfare. Now the considerations when it comes to minimizing the effect of tagging are how you attach it. So you want something which doesn't actually interfere with the bird, in most cases, things like leg mounts, tail mounts, glue mounted backpacks, these are all very unlikely to actually affect the birds. Harnesses, which are often used because they have to be, are more likely to affect the birds and they have to be put on extremely carefully. And they have to be really um, appropriately designed and fitted. Uh, weight is a very important consideration. We have a rule of thumb for a uh, percentage of body weight, which is usually 3% for most species, less larger birds. It does depend a bit on the lifestyle of the species and where you're putting the tag as to what the percentage weight should be. Uh, if you're putting a tag on the tail, it's further from the center of lift. So we tend to go with a lighter weight tag, lower percentage, more like 2% than if the tag is on the center of the back, which is in the center of lift. And finally, you've got to make sure when you fit your harness that it's, it's nicely fitted, it's not going to move around, it's not going to rub the bird. And it's a difficult thing to define in hard terms, actually. It's easier to set a weight, you know, you have a rule of thumb, a percentage, 
But when it comes to making sure the harness fit is right, like how tight should it be, that's quite tricky. Uh, and it depends on the skills of the people who are fitting the tags. And, and everyone who does this is highly trained and eventually very skilled before they get to put tags on themselves. And then I've included aerodynamics in here as well, which is um, starting to become more important or considered more, I think, than it used to be, mainly because a lot of solar tags are used now and the tags have to be outside the feathers. And therefore, more of the tag is exposed to the airflow and it can increase the drag of the bird. Uh, here's a quick example of a tag which is reasonable aerodynamics and also is, is camouflaged. This is a, a sage grouse and sage grouse uh, live out in the open and are predated by avian predators and so they have to be hidden very very effectively so they don't want to have a big colorful tag on their back which uh, says here I am come and eat me. So we've um, we camouflaged the, the tag, we painted it by hand to make it look like a sage grouse. We didn't do a too, too bad a job there. We also made the top of the tag which is a sort of clear plastic dome. We, um, we made it slightly dull so it didn't shine and we also painted the antennas brown. One thing we couldn't change, unfortunately, was the solar panels. They're blue and if you paint them, they don't work. In order to make this tag more aerodynamic and to keep the profile down, we, uh, we put these grooves in the side uh, and although you can't really see it there because it hasn't bedded into the feathers yet, if the feathers do rise up the side of the tag, they'll go into these grooves rather than covering the solar panel. So we can keep the tag as low as possible whilst keeping the feathers out of the way. The alternative way to do this is to make the tag higher put it on a foam pad, which raises the whole thing, which may create more drag, so the aerodynamics isn't so good. And also this tag is slightly pointed at the front, which makes it a little bit better. The frontal area of a tag is very important for diminishing its aerodynamic drag. Here's a graph, uh, which uh, one of my favorite graphs, actually. It's got a nice, uh, simple graph. Hopefully it shows you pretty clearly. It's, uh, it's basically the um, body weight in grams of bird, all bird species, I guess of the world. Uh, it's a log scale. And then up here you have the number of species which fall into each of the distributions. So it's a, it's a frequency distribution curve. So you can see from it that uh, the vast majority of birds are small. They're something between 10 and 30 grams in this region here. And the graph also shows what sort of tags can be used on these different species. Now this is quite an old graph. It's from um, 2011. Uh, so the weights on here are a bit higher than they are now. So I've put in the change has been in the size of the different sorts of tags. The very lightest ones, and I'll talk more about these later on, are geologgers, which actually we call geolocators. Uh, I'll explain about those. Those can be used on, on pretty small species, they now weigh less than 0.3 of a gram. GPS data loggers, those are GPS receivers which are stay on the bird and you have to get them off to get the data. Satellite Argos, which is a, a satellite system I'll explain later on. And now as you go further this way, the tags get bigger and you also get more sophisticated. They're all GPS but they communicate with the biologists in different ways to get their data off. So you can put them on bigger and bigger birds and get more and more data. So always, of course, thinking back to the welfare and, and validity of research, lighter is better, but larger tags get more and better data. The next one I'm going to do a roundup of the tracking technologies one by one. Starting with radio tracking, which I call the good old days because it's what I started doing and it's been around since, well, I don't know, probably the early 60s actually, I think is when it was first uh, invented as it were. And what you need to do radio tracking is a receiver, special receiver here, very, very sensitive receiver for hearing the signals and a directional Yagi antenna. And uh, this is Thomas, who you heard speaking earlier, standing on top of that Land Rover again. Uh, and this time the mast is a trip hazard. Uh, so how does radio tracking work? I expect most people know this already. It's a process of, of triangulation. So you have two positions with your your antenna, this is a directional antenna, so when you're pointing it towards the signal, that's when you get the loudest bleep. These tags are just bleeping away with radio, sending off radio signals, which you hear as bleeps in your receiver. And, and when you're pointing at the, at the tag, that's when it's loudest. So you take bearings, these bearings from two locations, uh, and that gives you a point where they cross, which is where the tag is, more or less. Of course, it's not that accurate, so what you end up with actually is, a, is an error, and the further away you are, the greater the error and you get an error polygon. Uh, now you can take three bearings, which gives you a slightly smaller polygon, so it reduces your error, but uh, this, this requires more work. And of course, this is very labor intensive. Remarkable really now that we used to do this. Well, actually people still do this, of course, it's because the tags are very small. So um, there's still a lot of people using conventional radio tracking, especially for tracking things like bats and insects, which I'll talk more about later, well, insects anyway. 
and the more bearings you take, the more accurate it is. Uh, the trouble is you, you don't normally have the, the luxury of three people tracking at once, so you have to move around in order to get these three different bearings. Uh, so we use, just to, I'll give you an example of how we've used these, these tags uh, in the past. Oh, it's night jars again. There's a, a young night jar, not being very happy about us being there. You see the huge gate they have, amazing. They have this, and that's even, it's even bigger than that. This is sort of to enlarge the capture area for catching moths. So we use these radio tags that were stuck on the back of the birds. And, uh, and there's a little tiny um, wire here that came out to a thermistor, which is a temperature sensing device, which goes under the wing. We use these, this is back in the 1980s, well, you know, between 85 and 90, we were using these. Um, and this changed the pulse rate of the tag so that we could tell when the bird was flying. And we also had a little beetle light on here. This is a little tritium filled capsule painted inside with phosphorescent paint and it glows in the dark. Uh, and we used to be able to watch the birds whilst we were listening to the signal so we could calibrate what we heard from the signal changes against what we saw the bird doing. And we, we used that to discover how the birds were feeding, whether they were feeding continuously or whether they were fly catching. Fly catching is quite a common way for night jars to feed. So we used to go tracking these birds. So this is, this is the data we, we had from um, looking back to my first slide, the Mini and the Triumph Herald. These are all the places we used to drive to. The birds, to our surprise, didn't hang around on their breeding areas at night. They went off to feed up to um, seven kilometers away. Uh, or more actually, we lost one at seven kilometers. And the average was 3.2 kilometers. So they, um, they traveled a fair old bit, but it was a lot of work and we just got one or two locations per night. So radio tracking, very labor intensive. And nowadays you only really do it if you haven't got any other option because you can't use a tag which is small enough for your species. This is a more modern application of radio tracking, radio tracking Asian hornets. Now this is done by a chap called Peter Kennedy at the University of Exeter. And he's putting these really tiny tags onto Asian hornets. Uh, and I expect you all know the problem with Asian, Asian hornets is that they are um, they're a major threat to honeybees uh, in this country. We don't currently, we hope, have any here, but some of them come in every year. Hopefully if someone finds they notify DEFRA and then the bee inspectors are called in, here's a bee inspector here, and, and they want to basically need to find the nests. So as soon as they find a Asian hornet, they need to find a nest and destroy the nest. If they don't destroy the nest, and it overwinters and all the queens that overwintered in the nest will all go out and start their own nest and it's game over. There'll be Asian hornets in this country uh, and that'll be a massive problem for, uh, for bees. So what Peter's been doing is hooking these little tags onto the waist of the hornets and then tracking them back to the nest in order to find it and then to destroy the nest. So they're sort of Judas hornets. I talked about rules of thumb earlier about uh, the size of tags that we used and 3% of body weight is typical. Uh, not for Asian hornets because we're putting about 50% of body weight on them. Um, so they definitely are being affected. But as long as they can fly above horizontal and get back to their nest, they're doing their job. What I really like about Asian hornets, well not actually like about Asian hornets, but what I, what I've, I find fascinating, something that Peter told us when he came to give a talk about it, is, um, is how the... Um, is how the native bees, at least actually these are, this is an example I think more of giant Asian hornets, which are a different species in Japan, uh, and Japanese honeybees. And these, these two species have co-evolved. So in, in the classic evolutionary arm, arms race, they have ways of dealing with each other. Uh, but just to get back to the problem with our, our honeybees in the, in the UK and in Europe, the Asian hornets are, are all throughout Europe now. The, the problem is, is what well, they eat bees. So that's, that's not good. However, they don't eat in enough bees for that to be a massive problem. The problem is the way the bees behave or the way they, the way they react to the hornets. And when there's a hornet around, they just they don't come out of their hive. They stay in cowering. Uh, and, uh, and that's uh, obviously causes a problem because they're not going out foraging. And so the hive does really badly, doesn't get enough foraging and, and uh, presumably can even collapse completely. So that's the fundamental problem. But what, what bees that have co-evolved with Asian hornets do is that they all bundle out when they hear a hornet and they completely surround it. Uh, so you get this great big ball of bees and they warm themselves up by shaking their wings uh, and, they, and they can survive at a higher temperature than the hornets. So they essentially cook the hornets inside this big ball of bees, which I just think is just an amazing thing. Uh, and that, that kills the hornet. Uh, the second um, tracking technology I'd like to talk about is light geolocation, and this is all to do with sunshine. Uh, these are the tags that are used for, uh, these are a couple of examples, so you see how small they are, these are grains of rice, and uh, they have a little light sensor on them. There's one there, and there's another one, and that one there. 
Uh, and they're little light loggers. So they just record light every four minutes, all the time, uh, store the light on board. And they're very tiny tags, less than 0.3 of a gram. They essentially work by working out the times of sunrise and sunset. And, uh, and then that dictates where they are on a particular day of the year. Uh, and they have a global range. You can track them anywhere. So they're used for migration studies. In fact, they're used for migration studies for very small birds. Here's a, an example of the size range. So here we are, we can, we can track pretty much any small bird now with geolocators because they're that small. And then they're no good for local tracking. They're only good for, for migration work because their accuracy is something like plus or minus 200 kilometers. So not great for um, finding out which bush they're living in. But if you don't know which country a bird is migrating to, which is often the case with our small species, then this technology will help you to find out. So this is how they work. This is a, a diagrammatic representation of day length in the Northern Hemisphere summer. So long day in the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, short day in the winter in the Southern Hemisphere. The Antarctic is in darkness. Now, if you derive the times of sunrise and sunset from your light recordings and your logger, then you can work out the day length. So that's the time between sunrise and sunset. You can also work out solar noon, which is just the middle of those two times. Uh, and from that, you can work out two things, latitude and longitude. Now, day length indicates latitude. So as you can see, fairly obviously, as you move further north, the day length becomes longer. So high latitudes are indicated by longer day length. Solar noon gives you longitude. So the time in which sun solar noon occurs will tell you where you are in the world, as, uh, as is demonstrated by the fact that we're rotating here in my little diagram. Conversely, when you go over to the northern hemisphere winter, uh, which is southern hemisphere summer, it's just the whole thing's just turned upside down. So the further south you go, the longer the day length goes, you can still work out uh, latitude and, um, and then longitude again from solar noon. Now the difficulty comes during the spring and autumn equinox, because at that time, day length is the same everywhere. So you can't tell latitude at all. Uh, you can, however, still tell longitude because solar noon is still valid. So you can tell where your bird is in this direction, but not in that direction. Uh, and this is a really useful uh, way of tracking birds, uh, mainly because the, the tags are so small. You wouldn't use these if you could use GPS tags, but they're bigger and you can't use them on, on small species. Here's an example of the use of a geolocator. Um, this is a golden winged warbler. And here's the tag on its back, and this is the tag that we've used on it. Oh, I should say that um, the reason that this light, light sensor here is on a little stalk is because it needs to come out of the feathers, as you can see from the back of the bird. If it's on the, on the tag, for some species of bird, which are sort of feathery, um, the feathers are too deep, then it will cover the light sensor and it won't work. So some of them have got this little stalk on. So here's your here's golden winged warbler on the tag, and this is a tornado. Um, and I just wanted to talk about what some researchers in North America discovered when they use these tags on their golden winged warblers to try and find out where the birds went for the winter and, and uh, how they migrated. So here we are, there's some pictures of um, what happened. To start with, we have uh, the arrival of the birds from South America, uh, where they, I don't know exactly where they were overwintering, but they came back and they came up to here to um, I don't know what state that is, I should know because I've been following the election, but I've uh, forgotten. Um, anyway, they come up here to start breeding. And then by the 26th of April, they're all there, all bundled together, all back on their breeding sites. Uh, meanwhile, over to the west, the storm's brewing. And these storms get bigger and more fierce and some tornadoes start appearing. These, these red things are, are tornadoes. And the birds apparently can sense these tornadoes coming or can sense the storms. Uh, even though they're thousands of miles away. And so they start heading to the south to avoid the tornadoes. So you can see these little dots here. Those are the birds that are, and they're all heading south. Tornadoes come through, storms come through. They don't seem to mind the storms because they, they're right in the middle of the storms. But um, storms go through, tornadoes go through and die down. Passing through, tornadoes are pretty much stopped now. And then the birds start to head back again. And by the 2nd of May, they're all back on their breeding areas again. So this was discovered based on just on these, these geolocators. Now, I quite like this example because it's, uh, it's typical of what often happens, which is when you're trying to study one thing, uh, which was migration and migration routes, you often find something else. Uh, and, and this is what they found. But the other thing I want to say about this is that it illustrates a risk in the technology and the way the technology works. It's been refuted by the authors of the paper, and I think they're right, but it's possible that this is an artifact. 
and actually what you're seeing here is a change in the time of sunrise and sunset and that's making it look like the birds are moving when they're not. Uh, what I mean by that is when you've got a big storm on the horizon it will cause sunrise to be later or potentially sunset to be earlier so that shifts the apparent position of the bird and indeed when this paper was published some other researchers wrote in to say are you sure you haven't got bias in this are you sure this is really happening and the authors uh, assured everybody that, that uh, it was for real and in fact what you see here was the storms wouldn't actually cause the birds to to, to appear to move south that, that it really was happening so anyway i just wanted to mention that because i think it's an interesting twist on technology and, and having to be careful when you interpret it that you're not being fooled by by something which you uh, you hadn't you weren't aware of oh and here's another night jar we use geolocators to find out where night jars went for their winter holidays uh, and they go to the democratic republic of congo not where i'd go for my winter holidays uh, and they go um across the sahara on their way down and then they go and make it they sort of move you back via west africa on their spring migration north and take a bit longer about it uh, and this is the actual bird the very first birds that we found to do doing this so this is a very important bird and we we're very excited when we got this back there's nothing nothing more exciting than getting the bird back with a geolocator on it or some kind of tag on it and you can get your data off um i should say of course you have to get these tags back in order to get the data they can't retransmit they've got a lot of data on board so you have to catch the birds again the following year after you've tagged it here's another example of a geolocator a slightly more impressive one it's the arctic tern and here's the tag it's on the leg in this case seabirds are often tagged with geolocators on the leg and these are interpolated geolocator tracks from 11 arctic terns that were tracked from the breeding colonies in greenland uh, and also one bird i think in iceland so you can see uh more where they go i've got a slightly more um a uh, clearer example of, uh, of how, how they moved and they've got these two routes south so they're breeding up in the arctic uh, and going to the antarctic for the uh, winter which is called summer in the antarctic these birds live in perpetual summer and they have the two routes south and then they have a single route back north which uh, s is across the planet it's a pretty phenomenal movement so these birds are going a phenomenal nearly 56,000 miles round trip incredible next uh, i want to talk about tracking animals from space there's several ways that, that animals are tracked from space but i'm going to talk about argos satellites um this isn't the shop argos by the way in case you were wondering so the argos tracking satellites these are on, on a polar there's about seven of them i think they're on a polar orbit they're doing this and uh, while the earth is rotating underneath so they they, they cover the earth as they go around um, their receivers, uh, they're actually weather satellites really and, and they, do, they carry an Argos receiver uh, and the, uh, the receiver and antenna is here and that's picking up signals from transmitters on, on birds and other animals over a radius of 5,000 kilometers so it's got this big cone of reception traveling over the world picking up the signals. Now the nice thing about these tags unlike the previous tags I've talked about is that the data come back via satellite so you know where your bird is without having to go and catch it again and also you know not quite in real time but you know quite soon after it the signal's been received but they're a little bit big so compared to a geolocator which is about 0.3 of a gram these are uh, upwards of two grams they are more accurate than geolocators so you can get it whereas with geolocator you might get a few hundred kilometers accuracy the accuracy of these things is between 100 meters and 10 kilometers and you can get about up to 10 locations a day uh, and they've got a global range so you can track birds anywhere on the planet and these are these tags are used a lot for migratory studies they're not really accurate enough for home range tracking that's when you're tracking birds uh, just in a small area as um, as will creswell was trying to do with his wind chat that lived in the bush they're for global tracking and they're mainly used to find the wintering sites and migration routes and refueling areas of medium-sized birds so they're big enough to carry the new satellite tags so quickly how Argos works is uh, it works on the Doppler principle so most people expect the Doppler principle the typical example is a siren on an emergency vehicle uh, and when you're standing in front of the emergency vehicle not literally in front of it but sort of off to the side in front of it uh, and the sound is coming towards you as the sound is emitted the sound waves are compressed and that makes it go up in frequency so it's a higher pitch sound and then when it's gone past and you've stepped out of the way uh, then the sound uh, is emitted as, a, as the vehicle's going away so it stretches the waveform and it makes it a lower frequency so it goes da, 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 sort of like that and that's the Doppler effect and 
this is, this is, of course, the Doppler effect that we normally know about, and that example is sound waves, but you can do exactly the same with radio waves. Uh, and that's how it works the satellite. This is the, the Argos transmitter. Uh, they used to make them for tracking ocean currents, so that's why it's got an inappropriate picture here. But anyway, it's transmitting, it's, it's transmitting a signal. As the satellite goes past, it gets it's get closer, so it's about um, as close as it can be, and it starts to get further away again. And that shifts the, the frequency, just like this. And that's how the satellites work out where the tags are. Uh, I just wanted to show you this because it shows uh, quite dramatically how much progress has been in satellite tracking in the last uh, uh, 50 years. Uh, so it built started in the 70s by these very famous guys called the Craighead Twins, who are North American wildlife biologists. Uh, and they tracked this poor creature called Monique the Elk uh, with this massive transmitter. In the day, it was, uh, it was pretty impressive stuff. They got some really important data. But uh, since then, things have improved. Nowadays, this is more like the size of tag we would use on an animal this size. Uh, and actually, electronics in it is more like this. So this is the equivalent for a bird. Uh, so you take away the collar and the huge battery, uh, and you're down to this sort of size. So miniaturization has been quite phenomenal. Uh, another example of Argos use, I thought I'd just give you an example of, of what's um, been discovered using Argos tags. Cuckoos is quite a nice example. And everybody knows, I'm sure, that cuckoos have declined tremendously, or terribly, I should say, since the uh, 1970s. And nobody really knows why. But we do know that uh, there's a much steeper decline in the south. So this, this is, maybe there's something going on here. So, so the BTO, a guy called Chris Hewson, wanted to track cuckoos to find out what migration routes they were using. So he put these five gram solar Argos tags on, which, which actually worked for multiple years. So they've been tracking the same cuckoos, some of the same cuckoos for several years now. So they get uh, multiple migrations, which is really useful. And this is what they found. So the first, the most, the first thing they found was there are two routes that the birds take on southerly migration. There's a, an eastern route, which is straight across the Sahara, which is pretty much where my night jars went. And uh, that's the red lines and the red, red dots where they ended up. And then you've got the western route, which is more around the, uh, around the western side of Africa, which is actually where the night jars came back. But these are both southerly migrations of cuckoos. Now, on their way, some of the birds died. And we know this because we don't have to get the tags back. So the, if the tag doesn't move for a period of time, and also they usually have temperature sensors on them, so you can tell when they get cold, uh, the either the tag has fallen off or the birds died. It's, you can never be sure, to be honest, but they don't often come off because they're fixed on pretty well. So normally if the tag's not moving, the bird's dead, and if it's cold, or sometimes if it's very hot, if it dies in the desert, the bird's dead, therefore it's not finding shade, then uh, it will get very hot. So temperature is quite a good indicator of what's, uh, what's going on. And what you see here is that the birds that, that migrated on the western route, these yellow triangles are, are birds that died on the western route, and then the red triangles are birds that died on the eastern route. Uh, and what you see here is this far higher mortality on the western route. There are 12 dead birds here versus eight birds, dead birds here. So the other important thing to note is that most of the birds that took the western route came from the north of England. So you can see here, this is a blow up version of this part of the map up here. And you see most of the red lines are coming from the north and then most of the yellow ones are coming from the south. So you've got higher mortality in the, in the southern birds than you have in the northern birds. And that's, uh, and that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a higher decline in the population in the south and in the north. And this could potentially explain it. Um, I don't know whether we know yet what the causes are, but um, drought conditions in Spain are a possibility, the last I heard. This uh, research may have developed more since I, I last saw it, but um, I think this story still, still holds true. Finally, I want to talk about GPS tags. Essentially, this is animal sat-nav, and these are the most sophisticated tags, and everybody wants to use this if they can. So GPS satellites are all over the place, there's loads of them. GPS is actually the American system. There's also a similar system uh, called um, GLONASS, which is the Russian system, and, and there's also a Chinese one, the name of which escapes me. But they all, uh, the, the modern receivers, or modern, modern um, GPS receivers like phones and cars, can use most of the satellites. So it, it's a fantastic network. And here's an American woodcock carrying a little solar powered tag. And the problem with our GPS is that the data are, are calculated and stored on the tag. So for the smallest GPS tags, you have to get them back. We call those store on board tags, so the data is on board. But if you can put a slightly larger tag on your bird, if, if it's a slightly larger bird, then you can download those data by radio locally. 
So when your bird comes back from migration, or if, if you're just tracking it locally, you can get close to it, maybe within a kilometer or so, and download the data using a special receiver, a bit like what I showed you earlier for radio tracking. Or some of these tags will also enable you to download by satellite, which of course makes it really easy because you just have to sit in your office and wait for the data to come in. Argos, the system I talked about earlier, also enables some data to be downloaded via it. So these tags, they're, they're pretty light. They're one gram, which is, which is not bad, but still heavier than a geolocator, which is 0.3 of a gram. So this is a global tracking system that everybody would use because the accuracy is around about five to 10 meters. So that is fantastic, certainly compared to 200 kilometers for a geolocator, but it's one gram. Now that's still light, so you can tag a lot of birds, but you can't tag every bird. You get about one fix per minute, so you can get fantastic sampling rates, although the battery is limited, obviously, if it's a small bird, a small tag, so the smaller the batteries, the few the fixes you get, and then you can track them anywhere in the world. Getting back to size, these are the sort of range of tag sizes you can you can use a geolocator on. So it's a lot of a lot of um, tag sizes, or sorry, a lot of bird sizes that you can use a GPS on. A lot of bird sizes, but still, you're not you're not able to use them on the majority of small species yet. So geolocators, term geologists here, geolocators still hold sway for the very smallest species, but GPS tags are, are sneaking up there. Now. This is how GPS works. Now, oh, oh sorry, I, I'm running out of time. I'm going to have to uh, skip this bit. Sorry, I, I wanted to explain all the equations, but I'm afraid I can't, can't. Sorry about that. So here's how GPS works in a way that I understand it. This is the tag down here. This is the receiver. These are the GPS satellites. I've just shown two. There's lots of them, really. And these are transmitters. So they transmit signals all the time, and the receiver picks them up. Now, the way that the receiver works out where it is, is based on a principle called time difference of arrival. And this is where it works out the difference in, in arrival time between multiple satellites. In this case, just example of, of two. So this satellite, which is further away than this satellite, it takes 60 milliseconds for the signal to reach the receiver from that one. And it takes 50 milliseconds for the signal to reach the receiver from that one. And 60 minus 50 is 10. So time difference of arrival is 10 milliseconds, and therefore this satellite is 3,000 kilometers further away than this satellite. Now, if you know where these satellites are when the signal arrives, then you can work out where the tag is. You need more than two satellites, actually you need at least three, but that's how it works. But the reason I wanted to show you this is mainly because of the mind-boggling numbers involved. The satellites are traveling at 9,000 miles per hour, and they're 12,000 miles away. And at the other end of the scale, uh, the basic accuracy of a GPS system is about three meters, and that equates to 10 nanoseconds at the speed of light. So the clocks in this system have to be accurate and have a resolution of something like 10 nanoseconds, which is this many seconds. I just think that's really amazing. Oh, night jars again. Yes, yeah, so I, I just uh, really uh, just to contrast the difference between the old fashioned methods of radio tracking, uh, and which it is here, I've shown you these before, these are the few tracks we got. Each of these dots is one location for one night jar. Just a few locations per night compared to what we get now, which are hundreds of locations per night. This is a, a track on some Heathland GPS tags. Uh, and not only do you get many more fixes, but you also get much greater accuracy. GPS tags are really fantastic. They're obviously they're used in all sorts of species. And then rather than give you another example, I thought I'd just show you this video, which is an animation created by an organization called 422 South using some data from real animals that are stored on a system called MoveBank, which is in um, German University, the Max Planck Institute. And they've done this really nice animation, which just shows you some movements of different animals. So I'll play that and then talk about what the species are as we go along. It starts out here, and first track is for a, a white stork. So a whole load of white storks, uh, and they're all migrating south for the winter. Through Gibraltar. Some go through, through Gibraltar, across the Sahara, some go that, that route, which we'll see later on. And they're all heading off to different places in order to, um, to have a winter. Uh, then it zooms in, so you can get local tracking data as well. This is a wildebeest in um, Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, and, and then... Um, bit further south, still the white stalks go, go south. Um, some of them, they go all over the place. Uh, and then we're now we're zooming into uh, African buffalo. Uh, and then there's a few elephants, you know, elephants are really difficult to tag. So I rather suspect there aren't that many fixes. There's the elephants, they're there. And then as spring, spring returns, the white stalks migrate back north to Europe. And this time they're going through that. And up on the western side, back to home. 
back to Germany and uh, Central Europe where they came from. Uh, and that sort of encapsulates everything there is to say really about GPS tags. You can track globally. You can also track locally because the accuracy is, is good enough. So you can find out where a bird migrates to. Um, and then you can find out exactly what it does when it gets to its wintering areas. Plus, you can also track birds uh, in, in their breeding areas and just to find out you know, what their home ranges are and things like that. So that's it. Thanks very much for watching and listening. Cheers. <laughs>